church online, I hope you're ready to praise the Lord with us. Are you ready? We're ready. Guys, are you ready? Let's do this. Come on. Put those hands together, everybody.
as a living sacrifice, oh God. We lay down our lives as a living sacrifice, Jesus. May you receive this sacrifice, oh Lord. Receive this sacrifice, Jesus. May it be pleasing in your sight. Yes, Father. Sing it together. Sing, Father. Father, here I am once again In wonder and awe and amazement So grateful for all that you do
lives and everything we have and everything we own. God, we give it to you. God, we surrender. And that is the posture of our hearts, Jesus. You're worthy, God. You're worthy. In Jesus' name, we have worshipped. Amen. Good afternoon, good evening, good good morning, wherever in the world you're watching from. We're so glad you're here with us. My name is Pastor M, and I'm the senior pastor of Mavuno Church. I'm so happy to uh, welcome you to church today. And uh, whether you are part of this community or wherever you're watching from, or you just wandered here with us, we're so glad you're here. And uh, an amazing shout out to our worship team. What amazing songs. Thank you for bringing them to us. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about is over the next couple of weeks, uh, our first Mavuno Worship Project release, our first song will be released. And we're all waiting in anticipation uh, to have that up on YouTube. Uh, please look out for it. It's going to be on your streaming platform. You, you'll be able to find it on your streaming platforms and on YouTube as well. We'll let you know as soon as that happens. Hey, uh, I'm so glad to have you here. If you're watching at home with your, with a group of people, uh, please use this uh, link on the screen. Uh, Mavuno at home, tell us where you're watching from. We'd love to support you. We also want to know where all our viewing centers are. Maybe some of you have invited friends or family members, office mates, relatives to watch uh, the service with you. And we just want to support you wherever you are. So just uh, use that link, tell us where you are, support you in prayer and any other way that we can as you continue to use your home as a place where people can encounter God. So we're so excited about this. And hey, uh, um, one of the things I want to also just uh, remind us is as we're giving our offerings and our tithes in a little bit, uh, some of you have made a pledge. Uh, for your first fruits at the beginning of the year and we're about to close that we're, we're, we want to just close that this month and so if you're in a place where you're able to bring the promise you made to God at the beginning of the year would love to conclude that and be able to announce it uh, next week what we've been able to raise uh, in through our first fruits that we'll be able to use for capital expenditure for the Mavuno movement across the world so uh, as we prepare to give there's a word uh, that really strikes me as uh, 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 as I think about some of the things that God has called us to do as a church. And, and this is a time when uh, the prophet Moses called all of Israel to bring gifts, to be able to, to build uh, the sanctuary, to build the place where people would worship God. And uh, in a similar way right now, we're in a place where as a church, we're trusting God to put up uh, spaces, uh, to buy land for different campuses so that people can have a space where they worship God. Uh, and, 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 and Moses had called the people to do that and they were so enthusiastic for this work. They were so excited about it. And they began to bring stuff. They bring, began to bring their gifts in kind and in monetary value. And at one point, they, had, they brought so many gifts, they be, became a problem. Uh, the workers were, they were, they were getting in the way of the workers because even the storage, there was, there was nowhere to store them. And so in Exodus chapter 36, Moses says a very interesting thing. He tells us, just, just, just watch this, it's on your screen. And it says something very interesting. It says, so all the skilled workers who are doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. And then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they had already had was more than enough to do all the work. What an amazing testimony of generosity that God's people were so passionate to bless the work of God until the leaders had to say, enough, <laughs> we have too much. We don't know what to do with it. Just stop giving, give it somewhere else. 
And, and, I, and, I, and I really believe that this is a kind of overwhelming generosity for his work that God loves to see in his people. And so even as I pray for you, I know many of you, that's where you've come from. You're, you've come from that place of generosity. Some of you have come from a place of generosity, not because you had extra, but just out of your choice to love God with what you have. And so my prayer for you is that even as you give, that the Lord will continue to extend his generosity towards you, continue to show you open doors for you, that you may be able to understand this powerful truth that you can never out give God. And so allow me to pray for us as we give and as we uh, wait to hear his word. Father, thank you for the people of Mavuna Church. Thank you that like the prophet Moses, uh, I, I am amazed at the generosity of your people. Thank you that Lord Jesus, your work will never lack because you've raised up people among us, uh, many of us who have said that we want to be kingdom financiers. And Lord, we see that time uh, when the gifts we bring are too much to do your work because you've blessed us overwhelmingly and we are overwhelmingly generous. And so I just pray for your people right now, for those who are giving, not because they're giving out of plenty, but in difficult circumstances, out of love and obedience to you, I pray that, Lord, they will find you faithful. Uh, they would find that it's impossible for us to ever outgive God. For the many here who can testify that the more I've given to God, the more that he has blessed me. I pray that, Lord, you'd continue to expand their territory, continue to enlarge their granaries, continue to fill their pockets with good things. That, Lord, they will continue to grow as kingdom financials, as people who are passionate about being a blessing because they've been blessed. And so even as we come to your word right now, I pray that, Lord, you would speak to us, speak to our hearts uh, open our minds. Help us to become everything that you created us for. May this word be an encouragement to every single one of us. And Lord, we pray these things, believing and trusting in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. guests from across the world, wherever you're watching from. Uh, if you're part of this family, it's so good to have you back. If this is your first time here, you're scrolling on YouTube or maybe somebody sent you the link, we're so glad you can listen to this message as well. My name is Pastor M. Moridi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of the Mavuno Movement of Churches. And I'm honored to be bringing God's Word to you today. We're going through a series, we're continuing through a series called Mythbusters, Busting Popular Myths About Christianity. And it's a really important series for us because it's, it's helpful. It helps us understand our faith for those of you who are Christ followers. But for any of you who are seeking, who are beginning to work, like, does this Christianity thing work? What is it all about? My hope is that it'll give you some, some thoughts, something helpful, some inspiration as you're on your journey of seeking. And, and we've, be, we've looked at two, two different myths so far. We began with the myth that a Christian is a person who goes to church and does good things. It's a moral thing. And we learned that this is not a true, it's not true at all. Uh, that instead, a Christian is one who has fully surrendered their life to God's rule and leadership, to Christ's rule and leadership. And last week, we looked at a second myth, that all evil and suffering in the world proves that there is no God. I mean, as, 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 as uh, attractive as that myth looked, we actually disproved it because we say that the presence of evil does not negate God, but instead is the reason why we need God. And if you've not had a chance to listen to any of those messages, you can go on our YouTube page, uh, Mavuna Church Org, and you'll be able to find them all online. Now, today we want to look at another po a common belief, another popular common belief, which is that all religions are the same. All religions are the same. Many people totally believe this today. Uh, all religions are basically just different paths up the same mountain, basically trying to achieve the same thing. So it doesn't matter which one you believe, as long as you're sincere, as long as you're really into it, then it will work for you. And I mean, at, at first, that looks like a very valid assertion. So we want to test it and see whether it's true. Now, let me say this. I want to make a disclaimer as I go through this message. It's a sensitive topic, I know. Some of you are coming from different places. Many have practiced different faiths. Or maybe you even have loved ones who are in different faiths. So if I say something that offends you, please understand that's not my intention. I really am seeking to be, to be true and to explore the teaching uh, that all religions are actually the same. Now, one of the big problems many people today have with Christianity particularly, is its claim that Jesus is the only way to be made right with God. And, and I realize it's a big problem because many see it as, number one, unfair. What happens to people who've never heard of Jesus? People who are born in a place where there was no church, they had no opportunity, their parents weren't Christians. Isn't it unfair to say that all these millions of people will, will, will have no chance to be right with God simply by accident of birth? I mean, that just sounds completely unfair. But number two, it also sounds arrogant. 
I mean, how can you say Christianity is the only path to a full spiritual life? What about people in other religions? Uh, are all such people, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, uh, atheists, any other, are they all doomed to hell? Isn't this like saying that my tribe is better than yours? Isn't this just religious tribalism? <laughs> isn't it just the same as, as, as the, is, is, isn't this the kind of the thinking that has led to religious wars over the years? So again, that just can look like a very arrogant thing to say. And then number three, it can sound very naive. In this generation, most of us have grown up in cosmopolitan areas. We're friends who are Buddhists, atheists, uh, Baha'is, Hindus, all kinds of religion. And it sounds naive to say, I have the truth and you don't. <laughs> it's like kids who are playing in a playground and saying, my daddy is stronger than your daddy. Like, like seriously, uh, isn't who you worship just a matter of preference and exposure? Uh, in fact, many times people are much more attracted to Eastern religions because they seem more accepting. They, they, they kind of seem to be like, you know what, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and it's like all things are the same. And many have concluded it doesn't matter what you believe as long as it works for you. That's really the belief of our age. The real question people are asking is, how do you think that you, how can you think that you're always right and everyone is always wrong? That just sounds like very intolerant. How can you actually say that Jesus is the only way? Now, I want to begin by asking a question. What is the one thing that makes human beings unique, different from other life forms on this planet? What's the one thing? Now, some of you may think intelligence. I mean, that just sounds like the natural answer. And it's true, human beings are quite intelligent. But have you realized that there are other intelligent animals? So the difference is not really, I mean, it's more of a degree of intelligence rather than intelligence setting us apart. Other animals also have intelligence. And it's true of other things that people think make humans different, uh, whether it's affection, whether it's being able to make choices, whether it's having a purpose. Uh, all these are great things, and it's true that humans tend to have more of them than other life forms in this planet that we know. But you know what? Uh, animals have also been shown to exhibit it. Uh, things like affection, you're going to find that they talk about uh, elephants and how they mate for life, and how when one dies they will mourn for a long time. And it, it just, in fact, they almost seem more loyal than humans. Uh, so, so you're going to find that a lot of these things are not necessarily, they're, they're differences of degree and not of substance. Uh, that human beings and animals share many of these qualities in common. But the one answer that I completely agree with is one that might surprise you. The thing that makes humans from all, different from, other, from all animals and life forms is this. It's religion. You'll never find a monkey, no matter how bright or how compassionate, building an altar in a forest somewhere in the Amazon, lifting up its hands in worship. You'll never find that. Any animal, by the way, given enough food, healthy conditions, space, and opportunity to reproduce, it will be completely content. Every animal, but it's not true for humans. All humankind left to themselves will inevitably develop some form of religious practice. Uh, it just seems very interesting. All the cultures in the world, everywhere you go, from Asia to Africa to, to Europe to the Americas, you're going to find evidence. One of the biggest things you will find is the evidence of religious practice. The need for religion in some form is a universal phenomenon. And religion, I want to put it to you, it's what sets us apart as humans. So, so what is religion? Religion could be defined as a system of attitudes, beliefs, practices through which humans search for a supreme being or some higher reality to help them control the unknown and give meaning, ultimate meaning, to life. And according to this definition, even the most sophisticated atheist today is actually practicing some kind of religion. <laughs> because what they're saying is that there's no true God. I mean, why do they say this? Why do I say that that's religion? Because what this person is saying is that because they have not experienced or perceived God, God cannot exist. And in that way, what they're declaring is that the ultimate test for what is reality and what is not is their own experience. And that's, their, that's just, a, it's just like any other religion. It's an attempt by a human being to exercise control over, over what is unknown <laughs> and to give ultimate meaning to life. That's what the definition said. And what the atheist is saying is, because it can't ex it, I don't know it exists, then it can't exist. In other words, I am the source of all meaning. That's a religious definition uh, or, or, or statement, if I've ever had one. Now, interestingly, all cultures and religions, all our cultures and religion, in search for ultimate meaning, they've come up with very similar solutions. From the ancient cultures of China, 
the, the, to all the way to Mesopotamia and Babylonia, the ancient African cultures, the, the Mayan, Mayan civilizations in Latin America, uh, all over the world. You are going to find that the same, even all the way to today's modern religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Scientology, Baha'ism, which other ones can you think of? Confucianism, Shintoism, Taoism, Unitarianism, uh, uh, Rastafarianism, Atheism, you name it. We all seem to agree on the basics of what ideal human behavior should look like. And, and generally people believe and agree on these things. Number one, that humans shouldn't harm other humans. And that's referred to in different circles as the golden rule. You should do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Rega most, you go around the religions and you're going to find that's something that most people agree on globally. Uh, that people should honor their parents and be kind to their brothers, sisters, children, and the elderly. You're going to find almost every culture believe this. That people should not steal or lie. And lastly, that people should care for the, the less fortunate. Now, that's an amazing consensus that you're going to find across the world. We all generally agree on what is right and what is wrong. It's almost as if it is written in our genetic code, in our hearts. Now, all world religions also agree on two other important things. One is that the world isn't working as it should. And number two, that people are not living as they should. We love beauty, but instead we experience pain and ugliness. We, we know what is right, but instead we are prone to do wrong. And as human beings, this creates a huge problem for us that must somehow be resolved. And that's where religion comes in. The activities of religion are an attempt to restore an ideal state of living. Whether you call it salvation or nirvana or enlightenment or just pure happiness, the pursuit of happiness, we're all thirsty and we're looking for something we know we don't have. And so today, those who argue that all religions are the same and trying to do the same thing, I want to say this myth is actually true. <laughs> it's actually true. And what a shock. This might even, and, and this might shock some of you because I actually include the Christian religion in there. All religions are the same. They're trying to do the same thing. Uh, you know, my wife and I had the opportunity several years ago to, to travel and visit Israel, which is a religious capital of many of the world's uh, monotheistic faiths. And we discovered that Jerusalem is the most religious city in the world. Uh, we visited the Church of the Resurrection, and we were fascinated to see thousands of Christian pilgrims praying with fervor as they fill that church, some even on their knees, walking on their knees. Very near to that site, we visited the Dome of the Rock, which is Islam's second holiest site, where hundreds of, of kneeling Muslim pilgrims prayed fervently uh, after washing their bodies in ritual fashion at water taps around the mosque. And then just down the hill, very close to that was the Wailing Wall, which is Ju uh, Judaism's holiest site. Thousands of Jewish pilgrims and worshippers rocked back and forth with such fervor, uh, or praying. I mean, pray, it, so much fervor that, you know, it's almost like they, are, they have so much passion. And, and, you know, it was interesting. The passion and sincerity were the same in all the sites. And if you went there today, you'd find exactly the same thing. That's what happens there every day of the year. Thousands of well-meaning people working hard to gain control over their known. And rather than leaving me inspired, it actually left me sad. It left me wondering. Could this really be what God enjoys? Because it looks like so much hard work. Uh, and many of you, you got, some of you are watching this, maybe you, you, you got saved in high school or college, and then you walked away from the faith because you realized this thing is all about rules and regulations. It's like it's just too much work. I want to say this, religion is hard work. It's hard work. And no, matter a grow, no, no wonder a growing number of people, especially young people today, are walking away from any form of religion. See, the Bible tells us, and the source of our thirst and the need for religion, they all come from the fact that we were created for a relationship with God. But then human beings rebelled, and their relationship with God, which they were created to enjoy, was destroyed. And that the rest of human history has been our attempt to restore this ideal state, to th bring things back to what we sense they were supposed to be. That's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And, and we're saying that this is a point of all religious activity. The real question that human beings are asking is, what can we do to restore things to what they should be? What can we do to ensure that we become everything that we were created to be? And whether it's saying a formula of words, praise Jesus, Hare Krishna, Allahu Akbar, whatever it is, whether it's wearing specific clothes, 
dark suits, long pleated skirts, kanzus, hijab, whatever it is, whether it's going to the right places, the church, the mosque, the temple, the shrine, whether it's doing the right things, whether it's fasting or saying the, the rosary correctly or bowing and facing a certain direction or, or, or having a bindi, a little thing painted on your forehead. It's all about what we must do. Now, I'm not saying any of these things are bad. In fact, they can be helpful in certain situations, I suspect. But there are several problems with religion. And I think I've mentioned the first uh, a couple as I've gone about. But problem number one, religion is hard to sustain. It's hard to sustain. Many of us struggle that, that, with the fact that knowing what is right doesn't change us. We still end up doing the opposite. And the problem is that humans don't have what it takes to maintain a relationship with God. Religion might give a feeling of satisfaction, but it's always temporary. It's a temporary fix. You have to keep doing the same thing over and over in order to please God and to quench your inner thirst. I mean, how many people have you ever met who consider themselves good? They serve in their church. They're godly. They read the Bible regularly, but they are aloof and distant to their kids. Or they're harsh and critical to their spouse. Or they can't be trusted around people of the opposite sex. Or they underpay and overwork their employees. And, and, and they're church leaders, by the way, or, or, or religious leaders. You see, religion, Christian or otherwise, doesn't cause lasting and sustainable change. That's the first problem. Number two, it gives no guarantees. No religion gives any guarantees because it can't. Because it's based on your effort. And as a human being, you're far from perfect. If you work really hard at it and you don't slip up, you're going to attain salvation or happiness. But there are no guarantees because life happens and we find ourselves sleeping back all the time. And then it's back to square one. So that's another problem with it. Number three, it doesn't satisfy. Religion doesn't satisfy. In fact, it can distract and preoccupy you with activities that don't, real, don't deal with the real hunger you have inside. Religion promises restoration but it can end up keeping you busy with activities that lead you to conform, conforming with what people think you should be conforming to, rather than dealing with the deep inner issues of transformation. And that's why I sometimes agree with Karl Marx when he said that religion is the opium of the masses. It really can be opium. It can keep you from dealing with the real issues. And so here's the real issue. We know we need something, but nothing we do can deliver it. And all humanity's attempts to come to God have not worked. We don't have what it takes to sustain it. But what if? What if the tables were turned? And instead of imperfect human beings trying to reach out to a perfect God, the almighty God is the one who chose to reach out to us and instead be the one to restore the relationship. What if God intervened in history and he said, you will never be able to do this. All your attempts are feeble and they won't work. So let me help you. Let me come to you because you can't come to me. Let me do it for you. You know, the funny thing is, that's exactly what happened with Jesus. That Jesus is God himself saying, I'm going to reach out to you who are trying to be religious because religion cannot save you. And Jesus said some very counter-religious words in his time. Very, his words are actually very, to me, they almost seem anti-religious. Because in Matthew chapter 11, uh, just a, a, one example, verse 28 to 30, he says these words. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. But, you know, some of that weariness, by the way, is from religious activity. <laughs> he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, he's giving an invitation. He's saying, come to me, you who are tired, you who are worn out from all this religious activity, and I will give you what you're really looking for, which is rest. If you're tired of, relig of religion, if you're tired of trying to do it on your own strength, then this invitation is for you. He says to you, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. He's saying, what you're doing is inadequate. You don't have what it takes to make yourself acceptable to God. You don't need religion. What you need is a relationship with me. Come not to religion. He doesn't say come to Christianity. What a shock. <laughs> he says come to me. What you need is not religion but relationship. And when you surrender to the fact that you don't have what it takes to please God, when you come to him for help, he's able to restore your broken relationship with him and change you from the inside out. You see, here is the math that religion is changed from the outside in. I'm trying to force change from outside. It doesn't work. 
Relationship instead is changed from the inside out. God transforming you from the inside so that you become the person that you were created to be. To make it even simpler, religion is spelled do. D-O. It's what I have to do. What can I do to please God? What can I do to make things right? Relationship is spelled done. <laughs> what has God already done for me? Because he knows I can't do it for myself. Religion doesn't work. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, give up on religion, try relationship. Yeah. Try relationship. You might ask me now, somebody might be asking, but, but, but didn't Jesus come to establish the Christian religion? Isn't Christianity what Jesus did? It's a religion. But have you ever realized that Jesus wasn't a Christian? Oof. What? <laughs> yeah, imagine, read the Bible. The only, time, uh, the only time the word Christian is used in the Bible is three times. Uh, Jesus preached many, many sermons. He never used that word. Uh, God's intention through Jesus was not to establish a religion. Jesus never even referred to his believers, uh, to his followers as Christians. He called them disciples. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, 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 I kind of sometimes think the concept of Christian might even confuse some of what Jesus came to do. And I, let me explain what I mean by that. Some of older Christians who are watching this, older Kenyans who are watching this, might remember back in the day when Kenya was ruled by a, a, a party called Kanu, the Kanu regime. And they were the only party allowed in the country and what they did is they took the colors of, and the symbols of the national flag and they made it their brand. And so that time, if a Kenyan wore a badge with a Kenyan flag on it, people assumed you must be a Kanu member because only those people would wear those flags. Basically, what had happened is this political party had hijacked our national identity. And because of that, it was very hard for Kenyans to own or be proud of their Kenyanness. Because if you try to own it, it would be, you'd be assumed you belong to that party. And that's exactly what I sometimes feel the Christian religion has done by hijacking Jesus. Uh, we've turned God's solution for all people into a solution for us who practice certain rituals and go to certain places to worship. And we've said God is for these people. Now, now listen to me. I'm not trying to be controversial. <laughs> that's not what I'm trying here. But my concern is this restrictive connotations that have distracted many people from the original purpose and message and mission of Jesus. The term Christianity tends to mentally lock a person into a religious mold. As in, us Christians do this, and us Christians don't do this. Us Christians worship here, and we, and, and we get locked into a series of do's and don'ts, trying to draw a circle on who is in and who's out. And we also act a certain way. I mean, we also believe that you have to act a certain way in order to get, to act, to get God to act a certain way towards us. Which is why for many of us, let me give you an example. For many of us, when something goes wrong, our first question is, what did I do? What have I done wrong? Didn't I pray enough? If you've ever had that thought, that's a good indicator that you are practicing religion and not following Jesus. Because God doesn't operate towards you because of the things you do. It's done, not do. And so to the belief, this belief we're exploring today, are all religions the same? That I want to say, this one actually is no myth. <laughs> the other two that we explored were myths, but this one we've actually found is no myth. It's actually true. Religion is the same. All religions, human beings trying to do certain things to achieve, uh, to control over their situation, to achieve their way to God. But Jesus is different. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion for Christians, but to make a relationship possible with God for all people. Uh, being a Christ follower is not being, following a set of procedures that can be ticked off. No, that's not what it is. Even though many of us live this way, <laughs> many of us who are followers of Jesus, we live this way. Now, I know some of us don't like this message. Uh, you're not enjoying it. You're looking very sad. You just look at your neighbor, they're looking sad. And the ones who are looking sad are the ones who like hard work. It, it just seems so unfair that, I, that others who don't work as hard will get the same reward. It's like, I'm doing it, and I'm being told I don't have to, and it's like, that's not what gets me the reward. It's like, like you're making me like the ones who are not working, you know? So that's why you're looking so sad. But here is what Jesus says. He says what he offers is not a list of do's and don'ts, but relationship. It's not about you reaching out to God, but about God reaching out to you. And it stops being something you're trying to do and become something that God has done in you. Jesus' invitation to all of us, regardless of our religious background, is this. Give up on religion. Try relationship. Now, somebody might be hearing this message and saying, so pastor said we don't go to church and do whatever we want to do. <laughs> and that's not what I'm saying. Let me, give, let me tell you why I'm not saying that. When I married my wonderful spouse many years ago, <laughs> she's my best friend, Pastor Carol's my best friend, uh, 
no one has to tell me, please don't flirt with other women and please be faithful to your wife. Would she forgive me if she found me flirting? <laughs> now, I know she loves God. So chances are the, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is that she would. Does that mean because I know she will forgive me that I'll go about flirting and being unfaithful? Actually, no. Fathers from that. Why would I want to do something that would hurt her so terribly? So you see, the person who's truly entered a love relationship with God doesn't do things because they, they, <laughs> because they have to, but they do them because they want to please the one that they love and the one who has loved them. It's a whole different motivation. And that's why I say give up on religion. Try relationship. Re relationship is a whole different ball game. Now, I want to conclude. And I want to, uh, to, to, to briefly answer this question before I conclude, just before I pray for us. What about those who don't know Jesus? Because we talked about that earlier. Well, what about those people who've never heard, they never had a chance to hear? I want to be very careful to acknowledge that there are things we know about this and things we don't know. I don't have all the answers on this one, and neither does anyone. It's true that in John 14, verse 6 to 7, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is God's solution to humanity. This is what Jesus says himself. But the reality is there are certain things, we, we, we know that, but there are certain things we don't know about how that works. Number one, I'll, I'll give you just a few quick principles uh, for, to answer that question. Number one, God is a God of all peoples. God is not the God of Christians. He's a God of all people. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, the, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He's not the God of Christians, but he's a God of all the earth. Number two, there will be people in heaven made right with God who never had the name of Jesus. What a shock. I mean, look at the Old Testament. There's a man called Abraham. There's a man called Noah. There's a, man who called, there's a woman called Rahab. <laughs> Those are people who, no doubt, are going to be in heaven. But they're not going to be in heaven because, they, because they, they knew Jesus or they called out on the name of Jesus. Nobody will be in heaven because they worked hard or lived a good life. But because of God's gift of forgiveness accessed by faith. Acts chapter 30 verse 34, Acts chapter 10 verse 34 says, I see clearly that God doesn't show partiality in every nation. He accepts those who fear him and do what is right. I've heard of Muslims and Hindus who encounter Jesus within their own culture and practice. And every Friday, for the, 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 there are people who go to the mosque and pray, but they are praying to Isa, to Jesus. They've encountered him within their own culture. They don't put on suits and go to places on Sunday carrying Bibles. But somehow, I, I believe that God has understood. They've, they've understood how to be justified by faith where they are. And in the same way, there are people who are in churches who've rejected God's leadership and chosen their own way. So what am I saying? I'm saying I don't know how God deals with those who've never heard of Jesus, but are humbly seeking God. I'm confident, however, that God has, that everyone has an opportunity to choose a life with God or a life of self-effort. So that's number two. Number three, God cannot be unfair. God cannot be unfair. He looks at the heart. And he won't judge unfairly because of lack of knowledge or cultural or religious understanding. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 3, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Some people will be really surprised when all is said and done. <laughs> and, and let me just say, this is hard, a hard truth for us religious people to understand huh? and to accept. However, we can't judge other people or play judge on God's fairness. That's, that's not our work. That's God's work. And then very importantly, number four, God wants people to have, find confident assurance that they're right with him. And that's why he sent Jesus. You know, the Apostle John wrote these words in 1 John 5, 3. I write this to those of you who believe in the Son of God, so you may know you have eternal life. God wants people to have assurance. He wants them to have what no religion can give you, the certainty that you're in correct relationship with him. And it's something that you can't earn and that religion can't give you. And then very lastly, number five, the most important question is not what about other religions? The most important question is what will I do with the claims of Jesus now that I've heard? Am I open enough to honestly consider Jesus? He claims to be the only way to, to God, the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to God except through him. No matter what your background, no matter what your religion, no matter where you come from. Are you willing to suspend your religious activities for a while? and to try and understand this relationship for yourself. And I'm talking to people who practice Christianity here as well as I'm talking to people who practice Islam or Hindus or any other religion. Are you willing to suspend your efforts to reach God and begin to explore His effort to reach you? 
And I want to say, if you've never done Mizizi, Mizizi uh, is a class that we offer here at Mavuno Church. It's a phenomenal opportunity for you to explore what God has done for you. Whether you've been a Christian for 20 years or whether you're simply seeking to understand, I want to encourage you, uh, shoot us an email. We'd love to sign you up for an online class wherever you are in the world to help you begin to understand what God has done for you. So tell your neighbor right now for me, give up on religion, try relationship. Awesome. I want to conclude on this note. Next week, we're going to be looking at the last myth. And the last myth, I know you're going to like this one. Christianity is a Western religion. Ah, that's what we're going to be exploring. We're going to be looking at this thing. Is it true that Christianity is a Western religion? Is there more to the, to, to the truth than that? So please share this video with your friends. Invite them to join us. But as I conclude, I want to pray for somebody here who has been convicted today because you've been trying religion. You've been trying on your best effort to enter a relationship with God. And you began to understand, oh my goodness, uh, it's much bigger than that. And maybe today you want to say, I want to give God a chance. I want to surrender to God and His plan for me. I've tried reaching Him on my terms, and I've realized I can only access Him on His terms in the way He gave. And I want to pray for you, uh, to, if you're here, who, who's saying, I want to give God a try on His terms. Uh, also, I want to pray for somebody here who's accepted Jesus already as your Lord, but you've been trying to follow Him on your own strength. And today you've begun to understand, my goodness, I can't lean. There's nothing I can ever do to co cause God to love me better. Uh, I need now to flow in relationship and not in rules and regulation. And so allow me to lead us in prayer. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for all who are here, who are listening to this message. I want to pray for those who are here who've understood the power of relationship, the importance of relationship with God. And for the first time, they're beginning to understand it's not about rules and regulations, waking up a certain time, going to a church on a certain day. That's not what this thing is about. That the things we do, we don't do to earn God's favor, but we do them because we're receiving God's favor and because we want to love Him uh, in the best way we can. And so I want to speak over somebody here who's just saying, Lord, I'm ready to give up on religion. I want to try relationship. And I want to pray for you. If this is your decision, you'd, you'd like to say, Lord, I want to give my life to you. I've been trying to do it my own way, but I can't. I want to surrender my life to you. If this is you, say this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I come to you today to say, forgive me for trying to do it on my own strength. I'm sorry. From today, I surrender to you. Come into my life, clean me from my sin, and help me to live the life that you created me for. I choose your way and not mine. I want to walk with you. So fill me with your spirit and give me the grace to be a follower of Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, if you've prayed this prayer, I'm so excited for you. It's the best thing you can ever do. Stop relying on your own strength. Begin to rely on God's solution for you. If you've prayed this prayer, shoot us an email. Let us know. We would love or write something on the YouTube uh, channel. We would love to get to, to know you, send you some information to help you take the next steps towards becoming everything that God created you to be. If you've been in a place where you've been following God on your own strength, I pray that from today, you're going to begin to understand, my goodness, God has done it already. Everything I do from this point forward is out of love and relationship. I want to invite you to consider taking Mizizi if you haven't yet. Again, you can also shoot us an email. Let us know if you'd like to be in a Mizizi class. We'd be happy to match you with an online class of people near where you come from. So with all those words, I want to say see you next week. I can't wait for us to tackle the last myth and I can't wait to see what God does for us as we conclude this month with style and with energy. God bless you, God's people. Amen.